I am a sucker for any game in a historical setting played on a map. But one thing I've been thinking about lately is how these games, 4X and Grand Strategy games, handle history. How do you turn historical events into a series of enjoyable virtual dice rolls and make it both satisfying and accurate? Is accuracy even possible? I'm going to cover a few games here, including Anno 1800, the Civilization series, and Crusader Kings 3. I'm going to be pretty critical of these games, but keep in mind these critiques come from playing them each for literally hundreds of hours. We critique because we love, and because maybe we'll have a few cool thoughts along the way. There are trigger warnings, so be mindful of them, and here we go. First, let's spend a moment on Ubisoft's Anno 1800, because I think it's less familiar to most people than other titles. At least it was to me. I think I can look at it a little more objectively than, say, Civilization, which I was playing before I could read fluently. Anno 1800 isn't actually set in 1800, or, as far as I can tell, on the planet Earth. You are set down on a starter island, and that is your island. Nobody else can have it while you're on it. You can exploit its resources, start with farmers, and gradually build up a class system of workers capable of building ships and luxury goods and weapons. From there, it's a race to go find other islands with other resources on them to support the needs of your workers. Eventually, you'll have complicated shipping routes, both between your islands and the islands of your competitors. But there's, well, a trade-off to trade. Like, yeah, you might need iron, but if you trade it away in exchange for a luxury good that helps a competitor support a better class of artisans, they gain a competitive edge. Anno 1800 is a fun game with some deep mechanics, and I think it's maybe a little underrated. It wasn't really until I started playing an expansion where an emissary from the Land of Lions, obviously an African country, asks you, probably a white person, most of the possible avatars are white, to come and help him modernize his kingdom, that I realized, oh my god, this whole thing smacks of colonialism and I'm about to turn the 4th of July into the 4th of shit. There's even a sugar cane and rum trade, with no slaves of course, but come on. What you have instead are workers to keep happy and cops to put them down if they're not happy. This is the game that got me thinking about how these games in general, history games with maps in them, both 4X games and grand strategy games, deal with history. Do not get me wrong though, I definitely do not want a realistic colonialism simulator. Like, sim genocide? No thank you. I do think it's interesting that the game through gameplay ties trade and the exploitation of resources to the sort of birth of capitalist classes and modern conveniences. You end up basically having a lot of less developed colonies supporting a very developed main island. There's something a little bit eerie in playing this game and arriving on these pristine, uninhabited islands that you're supposed to colonize, and knowing that the history this game is sort of drawing from, that's not what happened. Anno 1800 is a game that almost whispers in your ear. It didn't have to go the way it did. We can remember an alternate past that leads to our present that wasn't so nasty. And no, it couldn't have gone a different way because capitalism and colonialism are inherently violent. So moving on from Anno 1800's extreme example in Yikes, let's talk about civilization. Civ games start in about 4000 BC, just about the beginning of recorded history. You pick whatever leader you want to be, whatever culture, and you get one soldier and one settler unit and you find a good place on the map to settle your first city. Voila, a civilization. Eventually you meet other world leaders like Stone Age Teddy Roosevelt, Stone Age Queen Victoria, Stone Age Napoleon. This is silly, and the game knows it. I'm not here to play the CinemaSins ding on modern rulers ruling civilizations for 6,000 years. Those leaders are meant to be avatars of a civilization, and they're there because players like faces. It's upsetting late game to have your capital city nuked. It would suck if it were some faceless AI doing it. But if Mahatma Gandhi nukes your capital, that is so memorable that there are memes and articles about it decades later. That level of abstraction does tell me that accuracy isn't super what the developers are going for. At the same time, this game isn't based on nothing in history, right? 
It's called Civilization because it has a few things to say about how civilizations unfold. I think the technological advancement tree is probably the best example of what I'd like to talk about, so I'm going to focus primarily on that. In the early half of the series, it was maybe the core mechanic of the game. In Civilization 4 and before, any leader that got ahead of you in tech could curb stomp you. In later installments, that's been rebalanced because it's not particularly fun to lose simply because you were 40 years behind your neighbor in discovering riflemen, so they nerfed that a little bit. It's still mechanically important though. That skill tree is sort of where I start to get uncomfortable with Civ because the dominance of your technology, culture, and military is how you win the game. And because it's about dominance, the game needs kind of a way to compare you apples to apples to other players. Who's doing better? Who's doing worse? Civilization is a 4X game, and the 4Xs stand for Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate. There's some debate over whether the genre even exists, but if it does, basically everybody agrees that Civilization is one of them. Because of those goals, those very competitive goals, somebody has to win the game, right? Civilization, therefore, places advancement on a timeline. A culture that is more like mine, modern America, is more developed, and one with a smaller military, less automation, less exploitation of the land, less use of fossil fuels, is inferior and is likely to lose the game. That makes me feel really uncomfortable, because that is how a lot of people view history and their fellow human beings. Now, I'm a soft little dumpling of a person, and modern medicine has saved my life more than once. But I don't think that civilizations with different priorities or less access to luxury than I do have lost a game of history. I do think that in a lot of cases, we, meaning America, the UK, have subjugated other people, but I don't think they lost a game versus us. Those were crimes we did. Gameplay-wise, by putting cultures into this rigid hierarchy from Stone Age to modern, you end up with this version of history that's very much on rails. Is this linear view of history from Stone Age to modern accurate? No, I don't think so. I think we really did have points in history where things could have gone completely different and the world and the cultures we lived in could have been completely alien to us. Also, progress isn't linear. Empires fall and we lose technology. Romans made concrete that is objectively better and we don't know how they did it. The dark ages that followed the fall of Rome weren't like this horrible time period. We just literally don't have records from it because they didn't know how to store them. The linearity of history that Civ games portray is therefore ahistorical in a number of ways. Let's move on to the game that people think of when they think of historical accuracy. Crusader Kings 3. There is a lot of attention to detail in Crusader Kings. Its map spans all of Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. With a fair amount of detail, it captures as many actual historical figures, their likenesses, political situations, and their personalities as humanly possible. Now, it's not perfect by any means, anywhere east or south of Italy is treated as if it's run like a European country, which is not correct. Thankfully, we've just gotten an Iberia flavor pack to tweak that part of the world, and there will be more to follow for other parts of the map. The developers and the community that they've built around this game really do give a shit about accuracy, so there will be tweaks and refinements for many years to come. Despite an obvious influence from 4X games, Crusader Kings 3 is not a 4X game. Your map is already fully illuminated at the start of the game, and it's peopled with emperors, kings, earls, dukes, the pope, and other minor lords. You could expand your territory, it's often a good idea to do so, or you can just camp out in Iceland for the next 500 years and remain relatively undisturbed. In fact, except for clergy, republics, unlanded people, you can play anybody on the map if you end up unlanded or dying without any heirs of your own house. Game over. But there's no win condition. The game ends if you survive until the Renaissance, but between the beginning and the end, you can do whatever you want. 
And I do mean whatever you want. You don't explore the map in Crusader Kings. You explore the system. The kind of person who plays Crusader Kings 3 loves systems and loves finding ways to break them. And the devs spend a lot of their time patching out those exploits. For example, as of the 1.5 patch, you can no longer keep dungeons full of peasants and execute them periodically to make everyone too afraid of you to start a succession war. Which is fine. I guess. Oh, just one more for old times' sake. There are states with borders and you do have to manage your domain, but when you click on a country, you bring up the profile of the person who runs it, and your portrait is almost always on screen. You're role-playing as a specific person with gifts, laws, and stats. You have personality traits that are formed in childhood and are heavily influenced by your in-game parents and guardians. You can act out of character, but you may not have the stats to win the role you're attempting. Or, say, if you're a wrathful character, it may stress you out to control your temper. You also have education traits, which are bonuses to your stats depending on how good your education was, and physical traits. Scarred, for example, gives you a little attractiveness bonus, because scars are cool. You can contract a variety of diseases like typhus, the plague, venereal diseases. There are stress-related traits that you can acquire if you spend too much time too stressed out. Those can be positive, like athlete or journaler. There are neutral ones, like confider, which means if you know some secrets, you may be a little too quick to tell people about them. Which is fine if you haven't murdered anybody, probably. Or maybe you'll become a flagellant, or an anapeptic, or a drunk, or a stoner, which can help manage stress, but at a cost. Then you have the inherited traits. Some of these are beneficial. The intelligence, hardiness, and beauty traits are especially useful, and the highest level of intelligence trait, genius, is completely overpowered. You get a bonus to all of your stats, and it makes you easier to educate and makes you a better educator of other characters. Some of the inheritable traits are more neutral, technically categorized as good or bad by the game, but situationally convenient or inconvenient. Like Fecund, which makes you super fertile, uh, is not great if you don't want eight large adult sons trying to tear your kingdom apart. Of course, there are other ways to handle that problem. Giants are a little bit stronger in exchange for being a little less healthy, which doesn't feel good to say, but that's the game mechanic. Then there are purely negative traits with definitive drawbacks like ugly or scaly or lisping or mad or stupid or dwarf or albino. Wow, uh, talking about these real life disabilities in these terms feels kind of bad. Don't worry, it only gets less comfortable from here. The AI simply isn't as focused on getting good congenital traits into its bloodlines and raising their heirs to have good personality traits as you are. So after a few generations of careful marriage, you're going to look around the map and find many of the people with the best traits and good genetics are in your family or are related to it because you also intermarried with countries you wanted alliances with. Unless you actively avoid it, pretty quickly you're going to start marrying first cousins to one another. And theoretically, if you want to marry close family to one another, or just seduce an immediate family member in the game, there are mechanics and specific flavor text for that. Gross! I don't think the developers are trying to tell us something about their interests. I think this exists for a couple of reasons. First of all, the nobility of Europe was really, really, really related to one another. Second, whether it was true or not, it was not uncommon for nobility to accuse one another of close family relations. This is a Renaissance era example, but Henry VIII charged Anne Boleyn with inappropriate relations with her brother, probably spuriously. She was found guilty of it and ultimately beheaded for it. If you want some measure of accuracy with the same possible scandals, I guess it makes sense to have gameplay incentives to do this sort of thing. Last, as I say, the major selling point of these games are both exploiting the systems and choice. 
And it is a little shock and a delight when you see a menu item that suggests, yeah, you can do that. You can torture a nun. You can cut a baby in half. You can cannibalize the Pope and steal his hat. And I guess you can found a religion with divine marriage and concubinage and marry all of your sisters. That said, there are two different senses of the word can. You're not going to cannibalize the Pope on every playthrough, unless you're into that. It's just a thing you can do. In a very different sense, you can ignore the people husbandry aspect of the game. You're going to have way less to do and you might even lose the game because you didn't take every advantage possible in what is frankly kind of a hard game. But you can. Like, you can suck if you want to. I guess I'm saying this eugenics gameplay feels a little less optional to me than other mechanics. It also introduces some major inaccuracies, which feels a little bit weird considering how slavishly accurate they try to be in other areas. The worst offender is a genetic trait, pure-blooded, that makes inbreeding less of a problem and has a tiny chance of showing up if you do enough inbreeding. Although to be fair to the developers, you're just way more likely to actually get the trait inbred. Now I'm no geneticist, but I think if the Habsburgs taught us anything, hardiness to inbreeding in humans isn't a thing. The game does have fantastical traits like witch or possessed, but the flavor text has this sort of wink in it where yeah, you can totally role play as if you fully believe in possession, but it's probably epilepsy. The pure-blooded trait has no such alternate interpretation. It's the least accurate trait in an already really inaccurate inherited trait system. I do get from a developer point of view why the pure-blooded trait exists. It might be accurate that everyone in the aristocracy was pretty inbred by the Renaissance, but is that fun to play? Maybe not. It is a game and fun does have to come first. Also, remember Fable? It was that game series where you could choose to be good or evil. According to Fable's creator, Peter Molyneux, 90% of players wanted to play good the whole way through. That meant 90% of players didn't see half the game's content. You could argue that they still benefited from the content they didn't see. like. If the game is about making choices, then by definition, you get enjoyment from the road not traveled. From the developer's point of view, you don't make mechanics for people not to play with them. The typical player is a bit of a goody-goody. Not everybody has the vision to trap their sims in a hedge maze full of gnomes. So maybe you, as a developer, add a little player incentive here and there to be bad once in a while, just so that, you know, your work didn't go totally to waste. It's understandable, but are the results historically accurate? Maybe not. Crusader Kings 3 gives you a massive amount of freedom. At the same time, these eugenics mechanics are so heavily incentivized that I think you end up with a history that's maybe a little bit more debaucherous than it actually was, and that's saying a lot. Medieval aristocracy, or really aristocracy in any age, are kind of freaks. So that's my critique of Crusader Kings, and if you notice, I ended up giving two completely different and kind of conflicting critiques to Crusader Kings versus Civilization. Honestly, for a game to be perfectly accurate, you would need a game where everything was recreated in excruciating detail, everyone had free choice, and then everyone chose to do exactly what they did the first time around. That's kind of melting my brain in a way I don't think I signed up for when I decided to do a video about video games. On the one hand, we have a game that lets you, if you want, reform the Roman Empire with its historical borders, and another that allows George Washington to found Washington DC in 3960 BC. And then you have bubbly, young, blonde, Anno 1800 off in a corner playing with its keys somewhere, just not giving a shit, living its best life. Historical accuracy is not the main concern for any of these games, if we're perfectly real. 
So I think we need a different criteria than historically accurate. And don't say fun. I can't overthink fun, so it'll have to be something different. So maybe we should have a different criteria, like anthropologically insightful, something like that. If people historically have done it, if they could have done it, maybe that's worth exploring in a game in some way. I'm not sure my critiques of these games go away if I use these criteria. If anything, I think Anno 1800 maybe looks a little worse. However, when I stop thinking about is it really accurate to have all of these mechanics for Zoroastrianism considering they have only three rulers on the earlier map, and think would this be cool to play and explore and learn about? The answer is yeah. I didn't do this video trying to say these games are horrible, cancel them, like that's not what I do here. I personally think that really good games are born from critiques of the flaws of previous really good games. If I could have one grandiose YouTuber fantasy about the impact this video could have, it's that a developer somewhere is watching and sees these critiques as opportunities and makes something cool out of them. Wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> hey, so this and my Patreon are really my only social media right now because I lost my Twitter account. So if you could subscribe, I would really appreciate it. In fact, the more buttons you can click down there, the more YouTube believes I am a worthwhile human being, which is a little bit disturbing, but we, we cope, don't we? My Patreon supporters see my videos a few days early, and they also get exclusive essays every month. You can subscribe by clicking the link down below in the description. 